Hello and welcome back to Careers Talks Live with Max here from the Young Project, part of Trembridge Community Trust. And today we have another episode of Careers Talks Live. And today we are here with Thomas Holcroft from Trent Bridge. Do you want to just quickly say hi and introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Thomas Holcroft, known in cricket. Um, I am the head of marketing and comms for Trent Bridge for Nottinghamshire County Cricket Club. Um, currently, currently um, exiled, working from home, if you like. Um, and I've, I've also worked at Derbyshire Cricket Club and Derbyshire Police in the past. Lovely. So you you've kind of always been in cricket and in sport, I suppose, have you? I had 18 months in, in Derbyshire Police, so I worked at Derbyshire Cricket Club for eight years, straight from university. I also got some experience as a freelance sports journalist. Um, and then I moved to Trent Bridge originally in 2015. Um, a couple of years at Trent Bridge then as um, media and comms manager. Um, left for an 18 month stint um, at the same position at Derbyshire Police. Um, and I came back to Trent Bridge last October when the um, position of head of marketing and comms came up. Wow, awesome. Um, so is any just, cause I, I, I'm interested as well and hopefully we can kind of go off that. Um, people in, in who are kind of in the court, are you, what, are you interested in like sports journalism as a career or sports? Um, because I know that we had quite a few people who were interested in sports so it might be that might be a route that we can explore um so if you guys just kind of write that in the chat and while we are doing that do you want to just kind of explain so you, your job title is the head of marketing but you just want to explain what that actually means and, and what you do as part of that yeah so my department is there's the marketing and comms department i split it into four headings really what we do um brand content data and experience so just, just to take you through those things one at a time brand is everything it's kind of the outward um the outward display of the club if you like anything sort of billboards the branding you see outside the ground the presence on social media um content is the stuff that goes out on social media that goes out on our website that goes out in press releases the stuff that people read watch and look at um data that's about um direct contact with our customers either via sms marketing via email marketing or sometimes via direct mail in the post um and experience is something that we're all obsessed with here at Trent Bridge. We want um, our customers, our service users from the trust point of view or our visitors for, from an events perspective, we want them all to have a great time. And nowadays in, in cricket and I think at sports clubs in general, it's not just about doing that across the, the portfolio of cricket, international and domestic. It's, um, there's a lot of other things that, that, that we're in charge of marketing and commerce for at the club now, be that the trust um, participation in the game, um, the events business, on restaurant. Um, the, 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 it, it's quite a diverse range. You have to, you know, it's not just about getting into sports, marketing and comms and getting to write about cricket all day or football all day, what have you. All of these, all of these clubs are now diversifying in a big way and you have to be a bit of an all-rounder. Um, and... Yeah, I was going to say because... Your, your role entails such a wide range of things because Connie said that she's interested in the sports business sector, but not specifically thought about media and journalism. But I mean, your role kind of encompasses all of that because not only do you have to post things on social media, but you also have to like engage with the players and you have to write to a variety of different stakeholders at Trent Bridge. And part of your role, I guess, is to, as you kind of alluded to, is to build that excitement so that people feel like they're welcomed and they know what to expect when they come to a cricket match or they they have the, the information that they need in plenty of time. And I guess, like, even though that sounds quite, I don't know, a difficult thing to do, that, I guess, ultimately comes down to you and how you communicate with, with those people. Yeah, um, exactly. It's... Um... I suppose it's very easy to pigeonhole marketing as being around the persuasive communication to try and um, to try and convince somebody to do something, be it buy a ticket, be it register for something, attend a session, whatever, whatever it may be. 
Um, but yeah, actually, a lot of the communication side is around providing a, a smooth experience, really, and around um, just making sure people have got the information they need in order to get the most out of their touch points with with the organisation. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, kind of, you've uh, said a bit about like what route you took, and, and you went to um, Derby um, Cricket Club and the police as well. Um, do you just want to? You're right. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I was just um, talking about my, my, my daughter's just popped into the room. So just, oh, no worries. That's cool. <laughs> I was just um, encouraging her to wander out again. Carry on. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Um, I was just going to say, do you do you just want to kind of tell tell us a bit more about a bit more specifically about what your route was to get to where you are today? Because. I think you can't just kind of walk into a, a head of marketing job. You have to have quite a bit of experience beforehand, don't you? I would imagine. Yeah, so, sorry, Max. So, yeah, so to, so to begin with, I was um, school A-levels and then university, um, where, which was a journalism degree. Um, my first job was um, as junior as you could get, if you like, if that's the right word, within communications at, at Derbyshire. Um it was it was a new position actually for for a new website that they launched because amazingly enough with this was sort of 2006 they hadn't really had a, um, a content-led website before um so then it was just working through the ranks and becoming progressively more senior at derbyshire over eight years um i was running their their media marketing function um prior to leaving um and then it was an interesting move actually to trent bridge because I guess because Trent Bridge is a bigger club, um, I came to Trent Bridge and, and whilst I was managing a team at Derbyshire, I came to Trent Bridge the first time as media and marketing manager and I was managing a process and I was managing the media and I was managing that function, but I wasn't managing a team of people, okay. um, which is a bit of a transition for me, but that was, uh, it was important for me to not get stale at Derbyshire. I've been there for eight years. I think I was in danger in my own mind of becoming Mr. Derbyshire Cricket Club and, and that may have <laughs> that, that may have limited my options for future development a little bit. So so I took that move but but ultimately I wanted I've always wanted to manage teams of people which was why uh, the, the move out of cricket and to Derbyshire police appealed to me because that allowed me to go out and manage a team again. Um, I really enjoyed 18 months of the police actually and um, it doesn't appear that way because I did the 18 months and came straight straight back to Trent Bridge um, but that was because of the nature of the role that, that came up and was offered the opportunity to to head up the department to build and manage the team and all that at, at a venue that I loved working at was uh, it was far too good an opportunity to turn down um, but the 18 months of Dobbs Police were also a lot of fun and a fantastic learning experience because um, he, it was just it was a different crisis every day um, in policing. It was it was very fast paced and not much opportunity to, to to plan because you were always dealing with an ongoing situation that day. Um, but yeah, that's been the, uh, the that's been the route. I've been very lucky, really. I've had three three jobs that I've really enjoyed, really loved doing. Um, before so before I come to um, Connie's question, she just put one in the chat. Uh, I'm just intrigued. What was your what was your actual role at the Derbyshire Police? Was that marketing as well? Was that something different? So I was media and communications manager there. Right. So you haven't got a marketing function as such at the police because you're not you're not selling products. It's all no. more of a, a corporate comms function, if you like. Um, but yeah, I wasn't in uniform. I wasn't a, I wasn't a police officer as such. But um, it's, a, it's a big job with the police actually because it's all the public reassurance when an incident happens, but also the appeal side of things and trying to get the public to come forward with information to solve to solve serious incidents. Um, there was some pretty pretty high stakes stuff went off at Derbyshire Police, and I was there actually that. I will. It was quite a short stint, but I'll never ever forget it. Wow, that sounds that sounds uh, certainly sounds interesting. So the um, the other question that we've got in the chat says, um, at Trent Bridge, do you have a large media marketing department, and what different roles are there within it? So it's quite a small team. Um, it's small, but very well very well qualified team if you like we've got um myself as head of marketing and comms um and then we have a digital marketing manager 
Um, then we have two uh, members of staff at officer level. So one is the, the media and comms officer, and one is the marketing and comms officer. Very subtle differentiation between the two, but essentially those are the two sort of executive level positions, if you like, that aren't are manager or head of department level, but um, are key contributors to the to the team. And also, and this is quite an important thing that, that we do at Trent Bridge that isn't the case everywhere, is that the ticket office function comes under marketing and comms as well. Um, those two functions have to be so joined up in the way that they do things. Um, and also, the, they are, the ticket office are the keepers of the, the, the data side of things. They are doing all the transactions. That's where you get so much of your intelligence that, that tells you um, what messages to give to what people and, and everything that you need in order to market efficiently comes from those touch points with customers and from the data that the ticket office mine for you, if you like. So, um, so yeah, the, there's, a, there's a whole ticket office team that's, that's within my department as well. Uh, and, and sorry, uh, I've also got a graphic designer. So um, you can, um, when you're running a, a, a bit busy marketing campaigns, it, it can be very easy to suddenly run up quite a big bill using external graphic design companies. Um, so we decided to employ one in-house um, and he does, a, he does a fantastic job. That, that's been a really, really wise investment, actually. I was going to say, because when, when I came to Trembridge, I, I thought that, was, that wasn't something that I thought that would kind of exist at Trent Bridge, like having a graphic designer, because you don't really think about that. You just think of like a, a cricket club or you, and with the marketing side, you just think of like posting stuff on social media or interviews and stuff, but you don't necessarily think about the graphic design and the, the whole process that goes into that. So I think that's quite an important role to, to think about because people, I wouldn't imagine, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong in the chat, um, that you would think of that sort of career happening at a cricket club or within a marketing department ordinarily. Um, but yeah, I think that that's an interesting one. So my next question is, um, do you have any kind of advice or tips for anyone or any young people wanting to get into a similar position to you? Maybe they're wanting to get into marketing. They have a keen interest in social media. I see a lot of young people kind of really interested in, in posting on social media. They spend a lot of their time on social media. So what would be your kind of advice and tips for people wanting to get to where you are? Yeah, so advice wise, the, the big one for me actually is to be prepared to do something with nothing. Um, and for me, I got my, my break at Derbyshire Cricket Club because I, um, I hassled them. Um, I asked them if I could write for the website um, on a voluntary basis. Um, I, didn't, I wasn't asking for money for it at that time. And it was going to be my, during my university dissertation writing word content for their website was my dissertation project. I was required to write nine thousand words. I wrote twenty six thousand and then picked the picked the nine thousand best. Oh of my afterwards. gosh! <laughs> yeah, so, so but, but it, it's an interesting one because and I completely understand why they've done this. But universities nowadays have kind of structured the employment thing whereby they will say. If somebody works up to this many hours for an organisation, it can be voluntary. Once they work this many hours, they need to be getting paid. And that's done for the right reasons. And that's because companies could um, exploit young people for cheap labour, which, um, which isn't the right thing to do. It's, it's, that's not ethical. Um, but for me, it was just it was so important because by by offering my services for nothing, by not straight away sort of holding my hand out and asking for money and by just demonstrating a skill that I could give to them that they couldn't replicate elsewhere. I then got offered a job at the end of it, which has led me to where I am now. So yeah, don't rule out doing something for nothing. That would be my, um, my sort of main piece of advice, I think, to take away. And how much, how much um, volunteering or, or writing did you do before you got that job at the end of it? Like how, over what period of time did that take place? Yeah, so pretty much the, that would be pretty much the 26,000 words. So it was a, a sort of six month period in which I was pretty much the sole contributor to, to their website. So it was a niche opportunity that was, that was carved out by me, for me, et cetera. Um, but I kind of knew that A, I needed it for my project, B, it was great experience. 
um, but C, somebody was going to have to continue doing that forthwith because they can't um, set a precedent for a content-rich website um, and then close it all down because um, because Tom Holcroft finished finished university and has gone off and got a job. So um, if in some respects, I was lucky. In some respects, it was an opportunity I've carved out for myself. But if I wasn't willing to do something for nothing, um, in order to, to give myself that experience, none of it would have happened. So I'm really grateful that I did that now. And I kind of look back and think with the regimes that are in place now around when you're at the point at which you should be asking for payment and all that sort of thing, whether or not it would have happened. I would say people, people should trust their instincts on that. I think if you're, if you're being used as free labor to put data into spreadsheets eight hours a day um, and you're not getting paid for it, I think the, the, the company is probably taking the mick out of you and that's exactly the kind of thing that universities are right regarding gates but if you're involved in things that you're learning from and are really contributing in key areas um then i would embrace that and don't worry about the don't worry about the six pound an hour that you might earn when you're when you're young for getting it just lap up the experience and, and the doors that it might open for you in the future so yeah so maybe maybe that's an important point that you mentioned there about like doing stuff on a voluntary basis um of course it's i think it's only valuable if it's something that you're passionate about and you think you might want to pursue as you said there's no point going oh yeah like uh i can i'm happy to enter data into a spreadsheet for you for nothing but like there's no point in doing that unless you want to get something out of that unless you kind of want to take that step if you're wanting to go into data management or data analysis or administration or whatever, then at that point, that was going to be a useful experience for you. But as you said, don't necessarily go into that and kind of go, oh yeah, I can do that for free. If you're kind of doing that just to, to give someone a help in hand, like obviously it's great to offer yourself out and companies love to see volunteering and stuff, but I guess make sure that it's relevant. And I'm, I'm sure that you would agree with that as well, I would imagine. It's exactly right. Yeah, it's, I think it's about be be prepared to do something for nothing. Yes, but to sort of go out there and carve out the opportunity that's right for you. Derbyshire Cricket Club was perfect for me because I supported them as a boy, um, and their website at the time was terrible. Um, so I that, I knew that there was something there that I could contribute. Um, that I was going to enjoy doing and that I was going to get experience from. Published work is everything we want to do. There's a course as well. Um, that, that that can help you massively with regard to your grades, your confidence and, and everything like that. So that was the perfect opportunity for me. And therefore, I certainly don't regret doing it for nothing for, for six months. I think everybody's got to find and go, go out and find their version of that, whatever's right for them. There's not many Derbyshire cricket supporters around at university age, I don't think. So I was kind of, that was a pretty niche one for me to go after. But, you know, I would say that that opportunity... I'm sure is out there for everybody if they think hard about what they're going to enjoy doing and, and, and are prepared to carve it out for themselves. I think I was on my fourth email to the chief exec by the time he finally got back to me and put me in touch with the right person. So you have to be pretty persistent. We, uh, we've got another question in the chat. It says, uh, does your work volume increase during international matches and is your media work used in different countries? Um, so the, the international matches is an interesting one, actually. The build-up to an international game is is very full-on, particularly if it's a sort of world stage match like a World Cup game or the Ashes was, the week leading up to the Ashes was the the, the probably the busiest week of my, of my working life at that time in, in 2015. Uh, the international match day itself, you're in very early um, and then the first few hours are manic. And then once the game gets underway, everything sort of settles into its routine and you are there as a troubleshooter on behalf of the venue. But you do then have the opportunity to enjoy the occasion, um, to talk to people such as the, the media that are gathered at the ground to build your relationships with people um, and, actually, and, and actually watch a little bit of cricket as well. Um, in terms of stuff going, stuff going out around the world, it, it kind of depends. Um, even... Um, including my period at the police where it was about front pages, not back pages on, on a national basis as well, as well as local. I've never dealt with a story 
that went as big as the retirement of James Taylor. Um, uh, James, I, I, I don't know how much the, the, the people listening um, are aware of cricket and aware of James's story, but um, James had to retire in his mid-twenties. He was a knocked on England batsman, um, seemingly with, with everything ahead of him. Um, then he had to retire. Um, he, he, he almost died on the back of a heart condition that gave him a, a bad heart attack um, and subsequently was told he had to retire from the game. Um, and when we put that press release out, whilst we'd known for a sort of 36-hour period of maybe this was coming, it was a complete shock to everybody that, that received it. And that went fully worldwide. Any country that's got an interest in cricket, that was covered all over the world. We had seven branches of the BBC at the ground all at the same time covering the story, which is pretty bonkers. You'd think they'd be able to, <laughs> you'd think they'd be able to coordinate with one another and have one person there and pull it. But that story went absolutely huge all around the world. So you just, um, yeah, it's, it's just dependent on the, the, the quality of the story and the um, how much it resonates with people. Really, I guess as well, like with, with that, it's whether, who's like the first, if you're like the first to break a story or whatever, and, and you've got some sort of scoop, then it's going to go a lot wider than it would potentially otherwise. Exactly right, mate. Yeah, it's not. It's, I mean, when you're working for the club, it's certainly not about getting a scoop. No. Um, that's that you kind of leave that to the journalists. But in that instance, the decision was that not as James's club, rather than the ECB in England as the country that he was rep representing, were going to own the announcement. So we were the people that, that broke the news, and therefore, I guess we got the brunt of the reaction. Um, and yeah, it just went absolutely bonkers. Wow. Very, very quickly. Um, so you've kind of um, you've kind of made me think of another question here. What um, what does a typical day look like for you? Um, I think in, in Marks and Comms there aren't really any typical days um, because because every, every day is is genuinely and legitimately different. Um, yeah, it's very, very difficult to answer that. It's, it's Every day is around making sure that you're as good as you can be across those four areas that I said right at the start of the call. Your brand, your content, your data and your experience. Um, it's very easy in marketing to get pulled in different directions by people um, within the business that mean well, expect things of you that, that shouldn't at that time necessarily be a priority. And there's other things where people might not be shouting quite as loudly, but they really should be a priority because what they're saying has got real value for the organisation. So it's about trying to channel yourself into the right areas. That genuinely can look very different every day. Um, so there isn't really any such thing as a typical day. Um, but it's always sort of bringing yourself into those four key areas. Is this making us better? A brand content, data and experience, BCDE. Um, if the answer is yes, it's a perfectly good use of your time. If the answer is no, stop it. Move on to something else. Wow, awesome. And we've got another question in the chat which says, is it useful to know some foreign languages? It's definitely useful. Um, and I speak from no experience here because I speak English badly um, and I don't speak any other languages at all. Um, however, let's be honest, the spectrum of opportunities open to me. Um, there's things I've done in my career that have increased them. Um, and not knowing any foreign languages absolutely decreases them. Um, if I was if I was looking for jobs in marketing and in marketing and sport marketing and comms, I couldn't um, I couldn't look at jobs in France, for example, because I can't speak French. Um, and the same would apply. The same would apply to any other language. Um, working for the police was a, was a big one for me because that opens up a, a bigger spectrum because I'm no longer just a sports specialist. I can, I can, I've proved that I can do marketing and comms in, in different sectors. Um, but yeah, not, not having any foreign languages will be a barrier. And if people have got that, that's definitely an asset that you should, that you should maximise. And like, especially with, um, with cricket, like with international sport, I mean, may, maybe it's not, I, I think definitely it can be a big advantage because obviously with uh, Trent Bridge, a load of people come in for the matches from abroad, especially for the international matches. Occasionally you might get questions if you're kind of walking around the ground and people are saying like, oh, you know, do you know where this is? Maybe English isn't their first language. So in that instance, it definitely might be 
helpful to kind of know language and, and if you do know another language i mean in any job like whether it's marketing or not you're gonna you're gonna have a, a big advantage i mean maybe you might not necessarily necessarily use it every day but that's one skill which not many people have and that and that will kind of set you apart in almost any job because if the instance does come up where you can use it you're going to be at a significant advantage to someone else who can't so um even even if like obviously it's going to be an advantage in, in marketing but in in any job i think it's it's a big advantage to know some foreign languages if you're able to for sure i think we're very lucky as, as, as an english speaker um you, you, you're very lucky in that other 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 uh, natives of other countries people whose first language is, is other than english it's, it's it, english is a language that so many people around the world speak to a reasonable enough standard to hold a conversation with you so that's a that's a, a very lazy option from my perspective if you like but i am lucky that when journalists from around the world um come to come to trent bridge for international matches i'm able to talk to them in my native language because they've been skilled enough to to, to, to learn mine, if you like. So that's that's great. But the, during the World Cup, for example, the, the position we were positioning volunteers and ticket office staff in locations to engage with the public on the basis of um, them having knowledge of language of nations that were that, that were that were playing in Cambridge on those days. Um, yeah, it's just it, it's just got to be an advantage. I wouldn't say it's a I don't see it as a huge regret that I didn't learn a language because languages wasn't a subject I particularly excelled in at school. I didn't enjoy it enormously. I feel like my career is going is going pretty well without it. Um, so I don't I don't look at it as a yearning regret. However, of course, it would open more doors if it, if I could speak one hundred percent. Cool. Um, it's also it's also a pretty point. like sensational skill as well. It's also a very impressive skill when you meet people who speak multiple different languages. There's a massive wow factor there. It's like you know, you've got your stuff together. You can you can talk all these different languages. Very impressive. Definitely, definitely. Um, so, what would you say? I mean, we've kind of touched on the next couple, few questions, but I do want to kind of ask you them in, in case there's anything more that you want to add to it. Um, what would you say was like the biggest factor that helped you get to where you are today? So I had a conversation with a lecturer in my second year of university. See, and actually, because this the, this lecturer, um, I was in touch with him after I left university on a reasonably frequent basis, not as much as I should have been, considering how much he did for me. Um, and the last time I tried to contact him, I was told um, by his colleagues at Staffs University that he um, he'd had some quite serious health issues and then he kind of gone missing um, and that nobody knew where he was so I've never been able to speak to him since I don't know if he was okay um, I think about him quite often but but that's that, that this is the man who in my second year at university I went into his to his office to talk about a piece of work I've been doing and um, we had that conversation and then he said so what's the plan what what career what job are you going to go into when you finish university and to be honest, I was thinking, I don't even know what I'm having for my tea tonight, John, let alone what um, I'm going to do for a career when I finish, as I haven't even given it a thought. Um, but he said to me, well, your cricket stuff's good. I like your cricket stuff. I said, thanks, John. He says, who do you support? I said, I support Derbyshire. He said, what's their website like? I said, it's rubbish. He says, there's your job, go and get it. And so wow. that's where that whole story I told you earlier on, in terms of pestering their chief executive, doing something for nothing, eventually landing a job and working there for eight years. That's where that all started. It started with with um, my staff junior lecturer, John Rafferty. I'll be I'll be forever grateful to John, um, wherever he is. Um, I hope he's doing okay because he's, wow. he's had a massive impact on me, and I'm sure I'm sure I'm not the only one of his students that that had an experience like that with him. That is amazing. Um, so uh, kind of on the on the other part of that, and the, I, again, I don't know to what extent this this applies, but what would you say was like the biggest obstacle that you have faced in your in your career pathway, and kind of how how did you get over that? What did you do to address that? Yeah, so a big one for me was when I was working at Trent Bridge previously, up until June 2017. 
Um, I said I needed to freshen up my CV. I needed a new experience. That's why I left Derbyshire. Um, but there was definitely something missing, managing a process and managing a thing and not managing a team of people. Um, I kind of longed to be, to be running the show, really. That's what I wanted to do. Um, but the structure in the department wasn't there at that time wasn't structured at that time the club was happy with the flat structure of three managers that it had and no head of department in, in marketing and comms and um, that's where I had to, to, to make the decision to um, to step out of sport give something else a go and take the job at Derbyshire Police I'm very lucky that Derbyshire Police were prepared to take a chance on somebody in a position like that that had only had experience in sport um, but yeah it was it was it was it was a real obstacle for me because I just couldn't see I've, I've always said that I'll always be ambitious and I'll always aim to get as far in my career as I can. And I felt like there was just a block there because the the, the next promotion up from me was commercial director and from media and comms manager with the greatest will in the world. It's just too large a step up to take it in one hit. I, I wasn't going to get that job. Um, so that troubled me and that was something that concerned me for, for a period of time. Didn't want to, didn't want to leave Trent Bridge, loved it here. Um, but but I had to do so in order to progress. I'm really lucky that it's then gone full circle. I've been able to come back into a, a role with well, that, that, that's not only the role I always wanted, but also gets me a step closer to the next step up on the ladder should that ever become a possibility. So therefore, I feel like I'm in a, in a position now that's got a pathway um, that, that can challenge me to, to try and make myself better over the course of, of many years. Um, but yeah, that wasn't the case going back to 2017, and that was quite a problematic thing to get my head around. Really, I had to I had to leave in order to to, to sort it out and get get back on an upward curve again. And um, just just because I'm aware that uh, people may not know what commercial director is or or what the difference between like comms and commercial director is, or you know what that is. So I think it might be useful just for the guys that are here if you could explain what the differences is and, and why you couldn't kind of take that next step and what the what the differences are. Sure, yes. Yeah. So the commercial director runs the entire money-making operation of the organisation, in this case, the cricket club. So that is, that of course encompasses marketing, um, but it also encompasses catering. It also encompasses sponsorship sales. Um, anything that is, that is revenue generating falls under the director. And you are, you are a part of that in marketing. Um, I would say, it's easy for me to say, but I would say you are a massive part of that because all of those different channels of revenue generation need a marketing function within them in order to generate leads. Um, but just from the position I was in, I wasn't managing any people. And to step up from that to managing a whole not just a department, not managing a department now, but a super department that also contains other departments within it. It was, um, yeah, from one to the other, was like earth to the moon. So, yeah, that was the reason, that was the reason why I, I had to move on. And it's, but it's the reason why this job is so good because it, it, bridges, it bridges the gap between the two. Um, I think that's, that's an interesting one as well for, for people as they embark on careers to get their heads around, really. I think that um, having aspirations to take the next step up doesn't mean you're going to push your current boss down the stairs. You know, I mean, it doesn't mean you don't enjoy working with your current boss. And you, mm. It doesn't mean you've got any wish for them to move on. Um, what it does mean is that you drive yourself to to think I'd be able to do that job should that situation ever come around. Um, as I said, I didn't feel like that before, and I do feel like that now. So that's been, um, yeah, I mean, I'm in a much better place now. Awesome. Um, so I've got to. Uh, two more questions and then we will finish up unless other people have got questions. Uh, so if you had to do anything again, what would you change, if anything? This is, I suppose this, this is a really specific one, actually. And that, uh, this is where I kind of realised how serious stuff can get when you're working for a police force. Um, we, um, we put an appeal out, um, which was in relation to... Um, it was in relation to, 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 to two men involved in an act in a public place that wasn't appropriate. Um, a police officer wanted to establish who these people were and asked us to do, asked us to do an appeal. We had a sort of facial recognition of, uh, of one of the men involved. Um, so 
you know, if something's against the law and if the police officers are um, are endeavouring to, to 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 find out who did it, it's our job as a media team to assist them. Um, we put we put an appeal out to find out the identity of this man. Um, however, within 24 hours, I was then putting out the same man as a missing person who was very, very high risk when it came to suicide. Um, and I'm so glad to tell you that the, that the man was found safe and well. But that period of seven or eight days when he was missing, that I was worried that my actions might have contributed to, to, to the very worst case scenario. I'll, I'll never get those seven or eight days back. I'll never, ever forget how I felt during it. Um, and if I could go back and do that differently, I, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty damn sure that I would. Wow, that's uh, quite a powerful story of, of how like work can kind of impact you. Um, I think it's just it's a, I suppose the lesson from it is is to just think things through to the nth degree before you act. Um, I, I'm just not sure with hindsight that I'd thought of all the ramifications of of what we were doing prior to doing them. It's always worth just having that final eleventh hour thought before publishing anything. I think um, it, it definitely taught me to do that. Yeah, I was going to say, you, you, unless you've done it, you don't know to change it and you don't know that it's wrong and you don't think about the ramifications and everything unless you have a reason to do that. So, I mean, you learn from it at the end of the day, I suppose. It's a tough one, isn't it, as well, because I'm a genuine believer that you only learn by making mistakes and by mm -hmm. doing things in a certain way and, and, and saying that you would do so differently. But if that situation had played out in the worst possible way, um that's just a hell of a high stakes environment in which to make that mistake mm. isn't it so um yeah i'm glad it i'm glad it all ended well um but it still doesn't mean i don't i don't reflect on it a lot and and, and i wouldn't change it if i could so um we've got another question in the chat so if i was coming for an interview what qualities would you be looking for a good question. Uh, force of personality that is the 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 the, the single most important thing for me um, now, now I do understand that somebody's probably not sitting in front of you unless they've demonstrated um, the sort of technical credentials to do the job. I will ask questions about those technical credentials and I'm interested in the answers. Um, but the single most important thing for me is force of personality because I think technical things can be learned. Um, and you, you, you need somebody that you think, yeah, I can work with this person. I can work with them because they're positive. They show me pos positive body language. It's a difficult one because force of personality can still come in a quiet and introvert person. And it's also a bit of an intangible thing. I'm not quite, I, I, I'm not quite sure how to define it, um, but I know it when I see it. It's very, and it's, it's, it's very, very important. Um, it's just the, the ability to command your attention and to make you think, yeah, I can, I can, I can work with this person. Are you, are you saying force of personality or flaws of personality? Force. Force. It's, it's, a, it's just a phrase. It's just a phrase that I use to box it off. The thing I'm looking for. Force of personality. Um, I, th I think I think it's really important because you've got to be able. Again, quiet people can do it. Louder people can do it. Everybody needs to be themselves and be the best version of themselves. Um, but I just think the ability to to build relationships with people is so important in and certainly has been in my career it's been important in the careers of everybody around me it's probably important in every career you've got to be able to work with people in order to to, to get positive outcomes and you can only do that if you engage with people in a positive way yeah definitely um so the last question that i've got for you is what is the most important lesson that you've learned so far in your career we might have um, it, but yeah, so the most important lesson I've learned is look inwardly in every situation. Um, that doesn't mean that I don't occasionally have a little rant in the privacy of the office about what an organisation or another person has done that's made our life more difficult. Um, it doesn't mean I don't accept that the actions of other people or other organisations have had an impact on us, but it's always what could I do to make the situation better what could I do next time to avoid the situation if it's a negative one um, or to make sure you capitalise on something positive? If everybody looked inwardly instead of looking to blame others, I think that's in, that's in 
a career that's in the workplace that's in everyday life i think the world would be a better place to live in so that was the that was the best piece of advice i ever got wow that is uh that's some very very good advice there i think but yeah so thank you very much to uh crofty for coming on Pre really appreciate your time and and uh and your insight not quite as high profile as peter moore's but i hope you I hope you got something out of it no 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 i, I think <laughs> it, this is the thing though it's not necessarily about like job title it's about everyone's experience because everyone has a different journey to get to where they are and and people might not know about these jobs that exist and, and the different routes and pathways that are that are available and, and i think that's what this is all about it's about bringing up those stories and and just talking about it and make, trying to make people aware so yeah I, I want to thank you very much for your your time and, and your story that was really really useful and um make sure that you tune in so the link will be in the description to sign up um so that you kind of get an email before every careers talks live episode and make sure that you follow us on all of the socials, follow us on the, the Young Project and Trent Bridge Community Trust, and obviously Trent Bridge as well, the Cricket Club. All of those links will be in the description so you can check them out.